All right, this talk is based on the work of Commons Beaumont, a British uh, historian. Some people say an alternative historian. Before I get into this, I'm just going to read the forward. I'm just going to read the forward. It's a few pages of this book called The Key to World History. And it's a follow-up from Commons Beaumont from his great work called The Riddle of Prehistoric Britain, which is currently out of print, very hard to find, and you have to ask yourself why that is. This type of alternative history is pretty important to think about, contemplate, sort of add up in your head based on um, where you live, where you come from, what type of school indoctrination you've been through as, as, a, as a young child throughout your society and culture. So just putting it out there because to me this is not only fascinating information, but most people just don't know it's there. So, and I have to pay a great deal of respect to the, the person who, who uh, informed me that this information was there, and that's Michael Tessarian. He wrote a book called The Irish Origins of Civilization, which is phenomenal. That's another one people should read. And so I just want to make sure that, uh, that Michael understands that if it weren't for him, I wouldn't even be on this path. So I'm giving him, paying him an homage here. I would have never even heard of Commons Beaumont, um, among a whole lot of other people. I've looked at his book list and read some of his work. Disciples of the Mysterium and um, Irish Origins and Architects of Control, among others. But anyway, he has a good extensive uh, book list, and I followed up a lot, some of these books, all different types too, psychology, spirituality, um, history. I just want to make sure that uh, this stuff doesn't just fade away, and I'm just sort of following in his footsteps and just, I'm just gonna, like I said, I'm just going to read the forward. So stuff to think about. The way history has been won and conquered and taught to, uh, to me, to my generation, the way I came up in school in uh, Southern America, it's just amazing at, at how we don't, we don't question our teachers. We don't question our professors. Uh, we just assume that since they're in a position of authority that they must be, they must know it all. They must be correct. I have to say that's clearly not true as I've gotten older. So anyway, I'm just going to read the foreword to Key to World History by Commons Beaumont. This volume is a companion work to The Riddle of Prehistoric Britain, in which I endeavor to prove by evidence gathered over a wide field from ancient and modern sources that the British Isles were highly civilized from the earliest times, and indeed that Britain may be proudly enthroned as the true and original mother of civilization. I claimed on evidence produced that the supposedly lost island or drowned island continent given the name Atlantis by Plato was not a mere romance or myth without substance, as it is generally believed, but on the contrary, it was a serious epitome of the most stupendous natural catastrophe which has ever affected the human race, both because of the magnitude and the severity of that visitation. I sought moreover to prove that the Atlantean calamity was a variation in other words of the flood of Noah or, as the Greeks termed it, the deluge of Deucalion. For this purpose, evidence has derived from geological, geographical, astronomical, historical, and legendary sources to the effect that this major catastrophe afflicted northern and western Europe mainly the Scandinavian lands and beyond all the British islands. I claimed, in fact, that the Atlantis island was none other than the British Isles, which bear the scars of that catastrophe to this day, that Atlantis was not permanently submerged or even much of it, tremendous though the ultimate effects were. These islands I show were the true Hesperides, or happy islands of yore, and are known to have been inhabited from the earliest Paleolithic or Stone Age onwards, and were the original domicile of the sons of Adam, who were the titans or giants of classic fame, as well as being the Atlanteans of Plato. So I know I'm reading this, but I'm, I'm going to chime in now and then and make little, little side notes because it triggers other things that I've read or other ideas that may, you know, reinforce some of Beaumont's work. So just aside here, um, he's talking about 
the Scandinavian lands being, and the British Isles being the home of Atlantis and bearing the scars. And so I just would say anybody else out there should check out the work of Randall Carlson. He is a geologist who's all over the internet speaking. And he actually has dug deeply into some of this catastrophism from a geological perspective has brought forth a lot of evidence that supports it. So I won't go into all that evidence, but just check him out, Randall Carlson. My object, may I point out, was far greater than any mere academic effort. As some critics seem to imagine, to identify Atlantis. The disaster to Atlantis was only indirectly my theme. For what matters is what lay and still lies behind these facts as I claim they are on this evidence. For if it were the flood of the scriptures, it thereby brings into the orbit of Northern Europe the nations related to that event directly or indirectly, such as the Chaldeans, Egyptians, Israelites, Hellenes, or Greeks, and many others. It cannot be isolated as such, for it challenges the long accepted belief and dogma that the flood occurred in the Middle East. The supposedly original Chaldean, or also called Chaldean, as to which, incidentally, in spite of most careful investigations even with, within recent years, there exists not a title of solid geological evidence to support such a calamity in those regions. Inferentially, also, if correct, it must undermine the long accepted claims in relation to the lands we term Assyria, Egypt, Palestine, and I fear necessarily disputes the accuracy of many modernist interpretations from inscribed stones of papyri. So he's going to get into the nature of some of the etymology of these words, like Chaldean actually comes from Caledonia, which is an ancient name for Scotland. So there's links there. Um, what he's saying is that there's definitely a link, historical links. There's lots of evidence for this, actually, from shipbuilding to boat building to trade routes to papyri to stone carvings to um, actual like pottery and shards that, that the long and short of it is there was definitely trade routes and travel routes between Scandinavia and the British Isles and the Middle East, Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, the Indus Valley, Northern Africa, and all that. That's, that's pretty well documented. Moving on. In other words, we have been misled in these matters. My sole aim is to get to the truth regarding the past as it bears in many striking ways upon the present. But let me say, if the further claims I advance in this work are sustained, it must logically signify that the segregation of Bible history as a thing apart from equivalent classic peoples has piled up completely false conceptions and valuations regarding the history of nations in past times. For example, I produce evidence to show that the Uranids of Crete, which Crete was accepted by the Greeks, at least as the motherland of the original race of mankind. These islands were the equivalent of the people called Ur of the Chaldees or Chaldeans in the book of Genesis, and that they dwelt not in the Orient or the Mediterranean, but in the British Isles. So there we go again. The Chaldees, which are written in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, is actually referring to the Caledonians, people of Scotland at the time, but although it wasn't called Scotland then. If I prove correct in determining that such roads lead originally to the very ancient group of islands, the Shetland Orkneys, which straddle both Scandinavia and Britain, and that these were largely shattered by a violent natural catastrophe, we begin to perceive that the Gnostics and the Kurites of Crete, close kindred to the Chaldeans, were the sons of Seth, or Sheth, the sons of Adam, from whom apparently Shetland, or Sethland, acquired its name, in the regions of Caledonia, again, only a variation of Chaldea, whose sons are probably the most ancient existing race of civilized man. So there we have a link between uh, the sons of Adam, which is Seth or Sheth, depending on how you speak, where the name Shetland or Sethland comes from, the Shetland Islands, nowhere near the Middle East. Moving on. The account of the last days of Atlantis is particularly valuable in research where we are told by Plato of a great war between the Atlanteans and their blood relations who crossed the sea to reach them a war lasting 13 years, and in the 14th year, 
When the Atlanteans were at the point of exhaustion, the cities of Athens held out and defeated the enemy, but that all their warriors, like those opposed to her, were drowned. Leaving aside the statement that the original Athens held out and alone defeated the invaders, it was, according to Plato, an Atlantean city, situated on that island, and thus we must assume the mother city of the later Athens in the Mediterranean Greece, like other early Hellenic sites. We can, however, synchronize Plato with the Bible references to the flood. The actual events of these dramatic 13 years culminating in the great catastrophe is the main theme of this book. The true arena of this veiled yet historic event, as I endeavor to show, was the clash between nations known in the scriptures, including Gog and Magog, in which the invasion and slavery of other Bible peoples in the British Isles was the aim of the invaders. It culminated in extraordinary events, both in the celestial spaces and on this unhappy earth. The final celestial disaster itself, as I described fully in my previous work, was on such an immense and concentrated scale that at the same time so irregular in distribution that the certain parts were destroyed or rendered uninhabitable for a long period, while yet others escaped with only comparative sufferings. Among its permanent effects were a variation of the Earth's axis, a lengthening of solar year, and consequent change in climate whereby many nations in the north were forced to immigrate to obtain the means of subsistence. The myth of Phaeton describes how the ill-fated sons of Helios, having stolen his father's steeds, tried to drive the chariot of the sun, but they bolted, where they threatened the earth's extinction, and Zeus, seeing the whole world was thus in imminent danger of destruction, hurled Phaeton into the river Eridanus in the country of the Chimerians. The explanation of the myth, as Plato himself records it, was the declination of celestial bodies actually, it would seem, a twin or tandem comet which struck the earth in the Chimerian lands. This disastrous event is recorded on certain prehistoric Scottish zodiacs, as I showed in my previous work, in which the chariot of Phaeton is reported symbolically as wheels with a connecting axle described by Scottish archaeologists as spectacles. They begin naturally innocent of the intention of these stones, probably erected by the sons of Seth, or, I should say, the Chaldeans in the Caledonian lands. The Cimmerians, in whose country this disaster happened and where flowed the river Eridanus, converts the mythological into reality. They agree with the Chimri of Britain and the Cimbri of Scandinavian lands. The people known to classic poets as the Hyperboreans, dwellers beyond the north wind, the Galati or Galati of Pausanias, and the Gauls or the Gales or Celts, also the tall, fair-haired, blue-eyed men of the north. So, Phaeton must compel us to understand the myth by making us look to the north, the north of Europe, where he was thrown to earth. In a true revision of the prehistoric past, the Mediterranean becomes only a very secondary settlement of the ruling races of mankind from the beginning. Britain's remote ancestors through many centuries erected an advanced civilization, built walled cities with towns, villages, and ports, and sailed across ocean-going ships, being a maritime people of great fame. They erected also chains of powerful fortresses, some of which have survived the vicissitudes caused by man and the elements for well over 3,000 years, laid long, straight roads, and constructed canals which transported goods from one end of Britain to the other. Her sons faced hazardous voyages long before deep sea soundings were undertaken to the most distant parts of the earth and established trading centers and commerce while their main search was ever for gold. They manufactured jewels, employing gold, silver, bronze, besides other precious stones. And at the early dates, they mastered the science of how to manufacture bronze, designed weapons of warfare, and discovered the secret art of how to make and use firearms, otherwise called black magic. Solomon built up his wealth and made the Israelites in his age the dominating people of his knowledge of magic and art described by Josephus in these words. God also enabled him to learn that skill in which expels demons, which is a skill useful and sanative to man. 
Incidentally, Solomon was a grand master of prehistoric Freemasonry, a very ancient fraternity earlier known as the Kabari gods, its origin often attributed to him, and some of the mystic ceremonies used in the Masonic cult are probably derived from his epoch. Yet, how many present-day Masons can understand the inner meanings of the two hollow pillars, Jachin and Boaz, which they are so fond of symbolizing? So here he's saying that Solomon, you know, named his people the Israelites and was essentially a, a Freemason before it was called Freemasonry, that type of uh, philosophy. In the Great Migration, induced largely by pre-knowledge of what was about to happen owing to the celestial phenomenon, judging from certain passages of Jeremiah, the Israelites in their exodus were led through dark Arctic wastes where no man dwelt the Siberian lands. Many immigrants found their way to the shores of the Mediterranean. Others went by the river Volga, Vistula, Dnieper, and Dniester, to the Crimea, onward into Asia Minor, and thence to Middle East, where we find in Iraq what appeared to be a prehistoric Gothic inscription and occult design as to much might be said. In a totality of different directions across the North Atlantic, Others made hazardous voyages and endured terrible privations in search of the sun and settled finally in America, mostly in Mexico, ages before Columbus discovered that continent. Many again went southwest into France, Spain, Portugal, hugging the Atlantic or migrating into North Africa. The land we now call Egypt was colonized then, or not much earlier, as shown by astronomical evidence, and was originally peopled by fair Celts from the shores of Britain. This was the exodus of the Aryans, some of whom returned later to their primeval homes and about a century after, perhaps in some cases in less time, when earlier fears had been dissipated for humanity rarely learns from the past, and the fertile Britain lands invited newcomers. These islands were again occupied by nations crossing the narrow seas, including especially those from Joffrey of Monmouth, names of the Trojans, and other modern anthropologists, the Goidals. Okay, got to take a little side here. He's talking about the land of Egypt being colonized by uh, th- this group of fair Celts, also called Aryans, after this great catastrophe where the lands of Atlantis were partially submerged. And some people might think that's far fetched, but I would say if you open up the Bhagavad Gita, which I have right here in front of me, I have Yogananda's translation, it, the, the Hindus tell you about their history, and they also tell you where they got their spiritual knowledge. And they also tell you that they're uh, a, sun, a sun-worshipping cult, a solar cult. And this all makes sense. The sun is obviously powers everything on the planet, which is why my last book is called Sun King, and it talks about those harmonics that build life and sustain it. But but what I'm pointing at here is that the Hindus tell you that the people from the north called Aryans are the ones that brought their knowledge to them. And most people think Aryan just means like white people, but <clears throat> it actually doesn't really refer to white people. The word actually meant and means noble. So the reason why they were called Aryans is because they had specific knowledge of seafaring, of navigating, of time cycles, using the stars as, as a zodiac. They had knowledge of the seasons. They were, they were noble. They were smart. You know, they were able to travel. There were some, of the, some of the earlier travelers from, uh, from the time of the deluge or the time of the great catastrophe. So something to look into there. Panic and change of climate in northern lands were the main inspiration which sent these people on their long and sad treks in search of new domiciles. The edifices and religion of Egypt speak eloquently to the instinct of terror as their guiding motive, as I also showed in my previous work. The famous Egyptian Book of the Dead, influenced completely by the epic of the flood and composed in the name of Thoth, Hermes, in its ritual, caused the souls of the dead to undergo a fanciful, final, gloomy pilgrimage to the sacred west, indeed, I contend, to the very scene of the formal shambles of Western Scotland, to the legendary Amenta, identified as the tiny island of Staffa near Iona, 
in the Hebrides, which the wandering spirits were supposed to be judged by Osiris and were rewarded or consumed according to their lives on earth. Okay, there's a ton in there. First of all, Thoth or Toth is also called Hermes and the birth of Hermeticism, but we all know that Hermes is actually a Greek word for Hern or Cern, Cernanos. So that's a Greek word for Hern. And Hern is uh, an ancient Scandinavian god. And you can look, you can look Hern or Cernanos up. He was the horned god, usually with stag or um, antlers, deer antlers, stag antlers on his head, symbolizing wisdom. So there's a connection right there from Hern to Hermes to Thoth. So that's all the way from, you know, Ireland all the way down to Egypt. Now, of course, Egypt is a sun worshiping culture and they were, they were always communicating with the stations of the sun. And so obviously the sun sets in the West. And so in some ways they were always referencing when the sun goes to die or when, when the sun sets. And that's also the name Set or Seth. And so the sun sets in the West. And at that time of the world, that was the, the edge of the world. So if you were, say, Egyptian and you had traveled to the Shetlands or the Seth lands, you'd be following the sun and you would watching, be watching it submerge in the ocean in the West, the Seth lands. The flood to the world generally a vague and nebulous tradition really conceals the most appalling visitation of mankind has ever experienced. As he experienced again and its ravages in the British Isles and Scandinavian lands may be retraced in some considerable extent to the effects of what geologists term the drift age. It was no mere ice drift. It was sudden and terribly swift and violent. My present volume, as I mentioned, traces the course of the 13-year war to its origin and source in the Euclidates, the main arena of the dramatic conflict which stares us in the face in the scriptures if we know where to seek it and where to look. To be enabled to accomplish this, it has necessitated the identification of the most important regions overrun by the invaders from the furthermost north and from the direction of the Baltic and Low Countries. Much attention has been directed to the lands of the west, mainly Somerset and Wiltshire, so important for various reasons where I claim to identify sites known to the readers of the scriptures, some of which survive and flourish to this day. The complete annihilation of cities by man is not so easy as it may seem. Jerusalem was said to be destroyed stone by stone by Hadrian, and yet it still exists as a most important capital. In the arrangement I have found, it is advisable to devote the opening part of the consideration of Crete, the original Crete of Homer, because its former great importance in the world of prehistory. The third section describes in detail the scene and action of the Thirteen Years' War, and especially the part enacted in it by Jerusalem. When this is understood, it will be apparent how advanced, wealthy, and high civilized Britain was up to the Roman occupation, and thereby to reflect how sad it is that Roman ignorance, tyranny, and censorship have four long centuries presented an utterly false impression of the courage, genius, and enterprise of the various states of the island they so coveted, robbed, and left it in a condition of chaos. One further important point needs to be emphasized. The history of the civilized world in the past had little or nothing in common with Asia or Africa, and to get to the truth, we must raise the latitude of Europe to the lands mainly prominent and evenly largely forget the Mediterranean Sea. The Aryan or white race with fair or red hair or blue eyes never had any racial connection with the Oriental peoples. The brown skinned, dark eyed and dark haired races, the law of latitude forbids it, just as the northern Aryans who invaded India and settled there as rulers and princes despite the rigid law of caste they formulated in the course of few generations became absorbed in the native population and also happened in Mexico. Indeed, the world civilization owes less than nothing to the Asiatic peoples. Even the Persians, who tyrannized for centuries over the West, through treachery and through the use of magic, can really be traced to Russia, and the Russians, their characteristics throughout the centuries scarcely, if at all, changed, other than in name, and who in their decadence were overthrown and driven back to their original Oriental bounds 
by Alexander the Great. Virile races do not die out without a trace. We are told by historians that the Thracians or Thracians disappeared from their lands by Hellespont, and yet Herodotus says that they were the most powerful people in Europe who dissipated their strength by tribal quarrels. They did not disappear from the Balkan lands, for they were never there. Transfer Pontus to the Exquine Sea or the Hellespont to where they really belong geographically, named the Baltic and Skagerrak, and you will find the Thracians readily enough. They were the Scandinavians and were apparently settled from primeval times also in northern Scotland, whose kindred of the Caledonians, who, like them, held wives in common, tattooed themselves, buried wives alive with their husbands, adorned single combats, claimed descent from Hermes, worshipped Dionysus and their principal deity, raised mounds over the graves of their chiefs, and held funeral games, all of which were all the characteristics of Odin's followers. It suffices to add that the country beyond the northern frontiers was uninhabitable by reason of the icy cold, for it lay under the bear, the North Pole, the Great Bear. All right, another quick aside here. Uh, as the stars rise and set each day, no matter where, well, as long as you're in the northern hemisphere, um, there's a place that, that the stars never rise and set. They just spin and rotate in one spot. Those are called the pole stars, and they align our planet with true north and those pole stars are called ursa major and ursa minor as constellations and ursa is a very ancient word that means bear so the great bear is called ursa major and that is actually the north star north pole stars and it's not a coincidence that arthur is ursa that's the same root word so arthur actually means bear so in the in the Scandinavian and British myths, you know, you have Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Well, the Knights of the Round Table, there's 12 of them, so those are just zodiac stations, and Arthur is actually the center, the king, right? The great bear, Ursa. So those are ancient metaphors. King Arthur is an ancient metaphor for the spiritual wisdom of of the zodiac and the and the calendars, star calendars. It's a tropical and sidereal zodiac calendars okay moving on take again the trojans of classic fame they were a very brave and fine nation advanced in civilization who offered sacrifices to the dead and bowls of warm milk goblets of wine and also raised funeral mounds where do you find such mounds or barrows all over scandinavian lands and in denmark as in britain but never in the near east that's a key point right there they shook hands with one another and Anyone who knows the East is aware that such never an Oriental custom. Shaking hands is never an Oriental custom. How can we explain Virgil's statement of King Pyrrhus, slain and mutilated by Pyrrhus, as he sat on his sacred throne, that he had been proud, a proud monarch over so many countries and nations? But this we can say, the Trojans, after the great catastrophe, settled in great numbers in Britain, known as the Brigantes whose history I trace, showing an incident, and incidentally, that Rome was founded by men of this very nation, and that they became the ruling people in Britain, south, south of the Clyde, and forth. They never originated in Asia Minor, but as we will be seen, they originated from Ascania, Denmark, and the Low Countries, from the regions later known as Frisia. The Macedonians, well, Thracians, Cretans, Caledonians and Macedonians were all of one kindred, and they can be traced down to their habitat in Scotland and in Scandinavia, having many areas in England as well. Illyria. Why does Jerusalem appear to have been regarded as Illyria? It was not originally by the Adriatic Sea in the Mediterranean area. Transfer the Greek or Latin name to its British rendering, Syria and we begin to recognize how the history of the Hebrews, or the Ebers, of Britain was so largely played out in this island. Another key point there. So Illyria, which is Syria, which is in the history of the Hebrews, or the Eberus, and that's, how, that's the ancient name of Ireland. So the Hebrews are actually not what you would think as Jewish today. They came from Hibernia, or Ibernia, which is 
you know, northern Spain is called the Iberian Peninsula because right across the river is Hibernia or Ibernia. So the Hebrews are actually ancient Celtic and Scythian people. And that's a tough one for people to swallow. But if you start to look at the language known as Hebrew today, Hebrew, it's actually most phonetically closely related to Welsh, right? And Welsh is the one of the last remaining Welsh and Gaelic are the last remaining languages over in the United Kingdom. And they're actually speaking Hibernian or Hebrew. So that's a huge part of history that needs to be revised and people should know that. The Hebrews, the Ibers, the Ebers of Britain was so largely played out in this island. How few appreciate the true history of the risings of the Silleries against the Romans and who fought with such fatal gallantry in succession of wars opposing them, especially in the region of south of the fourth. Yet thus we shall be getting nearer to the truth. It will be apparent, in short, that Armageddon was the same event as the great catastrophe and that Jerusalem lay and still stands at a great and noble city in Britain. If this sounds stupendous to you, to make it nevertheless, this claim fits in with the rest. How many persons are aware that in A.D. 134, after Hadrian had defeated the Jews under Bar Kochiba, their proclaimed Messiah, and had captured their stronghold of Bathars, he caused Jerusalem to be utterly destroyed and the land devastated. With the result, it was full of graves, the markets with slaves, and towns given over to wolves and the wild beasts. How many more realize that the site of Jerusalem was completely forgotten for over 200 years until Constantine the Great caused it to be discovered for political motives in the present-day Palestine. That's a huge paragraph right there. I mean, that's just the birth of modern politics. You know, he's saying Jerusalem was originally in Britain and based on etymology and some of this some of this history it actually makes perfect sense. But, and it was forgotten, it was destroyed, and then it was uh, at least 200 years before the name Jerusalem was brought back into the public history by Constantine. And we all know Constantine at the Council of Nicaea decided to make Christianity the official religion of Rome, maybe the largest political maneuver in recent history. And yet, we know that, you know, just recently in 1947 or 8, the United States decides to make Israel a state over in modern-day Palestine. So thus keeping the Jerusalem myth alive that Jerusalem is in the Middle East and always has been. But this this doesn't make sense. I think that Commons Beaumont is on to something here. Continuing on. As I show in the following pages, the Palestine of today fails to correspond in any way to the Old Testament or come to that of the New Testament. A writer, Mr. H.D. Daunt, several years ago in a work entitled The Center of Ancient Civilizations, denied that Palestine was the biblical holy land for definite reasons. He claimed that the assumption is based on Hebrew documents alone. The account of the Israelites being made slaves and fleeing from the Egyptian pharaoh is not borne out of any other evidence but the contrary. An exodus out of the region of Sinai for 40 years with 600,000 warriors is an impossible story. Palestine, despite the accounts of its fertility and wealth, is perhaps the poorest land in West Asia, apart from the deserts. Such a civilization, with its many sites, with its many cities, must have left its traces in the records of the neighboring countries. But Palestine yields only the evidence derived from the names that have been scattered industriously about the land in various later centers and centuries. There is frequent mention by scribes, archives, etc. So the art of writing must have been well known. And moreover, princes and scribes seem to have possessed strong literary proclivities. Yet, notwithstanding all this, not a single inscription has been found in Palestine which can be identified with the Hebrew kingdom. Wow. Let me read that again. Notwithstanding this, not a single inscription has been found in Palestine which can be identified with the Hebrew kingdom. Jerusalem has failed to produce any trace of David and Solomon, any tablet or inscription or even foundational memorial. It might be added that the cities 
entirely fail to conform topographically with its full descriptions given by Josephus and Nehemiah. The name of Europe was originally limited to a part of Western England, and the continental Europe was Asia. Wow, I didn't know that. To study a map of Europe so late as the height of the Roman Empire as prepared from the conventional acceptation of the ancient geography, it is pathetic, the vision of the emptiness. Except for southern Italy, Greece, and Asia Minor, it contains Celtica, a vast and vague region stretching from the Atlantic to Venetia, and above it, east to the Rhine River, which is Germania. It stretches far to the east, with a few vague names. Dracia, Moesia, and Thrace occupy the Balkan lands, and Ister is interpreted as the Danube, whereas it should be the Rhine. Similarly, as the Hals River is placed in Asia Minor, but was the later Alvis or Albis, now the Elbe. These are few names chosen at haphazard. If I am right in these statements, the question may well be asked, how it all came about. The answer lies probably in the fact that the historians of the past on whom we have to rely were mostly the Greeks, and more especially Herodotus. But these Greeks were themselves very circumscribed in their knowledge of the world. They were unacquainted with geography because foreign travel was not in their purview, and mostly they derived their knowledge from the Phoenicians, whose purpose was by no means necessarily serving by the widening Greek knowledge. They wrote their history from records or traditions, but their geography was vague. I first realized such shortcomings when I attempted to trace the detailed march of Xerxes from Persia to Athens along accepted lines. But before long, I realized that his history simply could not possibly fit in with the modern conceptions and compelled me to follow out fresh investigations with surprising results. As far as Bible geography is concerned, it appears that the main person responsible for its misinterpretation was Constantine the Great, who had definite motives for transferring the arena of Jewish history and that of Christ to another region altogether. He used Christianity as a valuable political asset, selected the East as his empire, and with the aid of Eusebius, Jerome, and others, invented the present Palestine. I cannot explore this very important and fascinating theme right now, but hope to undertake it in the not very distant future, in the life of that remarkable monarch who was born in York in the Bedern. If this be correct, the present-day Jews who make a historical claim to Palestine are utterly wide of the mark. My aim, as I hope the reader will appreciate, is to reconstruct the past history of the world in which it appears that Britain, or more properly the British Isles, played such a prominent part. But one cannot correctly report history unless the geography is also accurate. And so, the position of the countries and historic cities become of major importance. In my former book, as in this, I have seemingly taken great liberties with geography, and I have to confess that in a subject so confusing and big, it is difficult to always be accurate. It means much research. Plato's famous Atlantis, as a matter of fact, knocks conventionally geography and all the history of traditions attached to it, sky high. Ignatius Donnelly, in his work Atlantis, said truly that the history of Atlantis is the key to Greek mythology, as indeed is the case. Yet, that mythology all points unhesitatingly to the earliest civilizations as occurring in the Atlantic regions and not at all in the Mediterranean or in Asia Minor. Above all, the history of the Old Testament is the history of Atlantis, that these truths will be accepted is more than I would dare to believe. The world is misled today about the past, and the truth lies at the bottom of a very deep well. I can only presume to be able to be a humble pioneer, but hope that I may be able to hew a rough track which others may widen into the great artery for the enlightenment of future generations. Commons Beaumont, 1948